Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Dermot O'Connor, and I'm going to be presenting this uh, Enterprise Web Development Module uh, to you with uh, my colleague, uh, Frank Walsh. So I contacted you there um, Friday, I think, wasn't it? And I gave you just some very outline uh, details about the module. So I, I think I may as well just get straight into it, really. And uh, any questions that you might have, uh, you can pose them as we work our way through it. I tend to uh, <laughs> I tend to keep talking as I'm lecturing. So every now and again, I pause and allow you to ask questions, but feel free to uh, don't be shy about interrupting me as I'm uh, talking my way through. Uh, if uh, any question pops into your head about any topic that I'm covering, uh, because sometimes I, I can go on without actually pausing. Um, so uh, don't be shy, as I say. Right. So I think I'll just uh, I'll start off by looking at the website. So I gave you the link to uh, this website uh, on Friday there, which you should bookmark. Now, I don't know if any of the other lectures that you had in the first semester, uh, I definitely know David Drone, uh, who's teaching e mobile app development. I'm pretty sure he uses this kind of layout as well for his module. Um, and so as we work our way through this module, I'll be adding new cards as these are called. I'll be adding new cards to this website. This card here uh, behind that will be the recordings of each lecture. So clearly there's nothing there yet, but I'll update that uh, later this evening after today's lecture. Uh, the first topic we look at is TypeScript, but I guess before that I should give you some sort of overview of the module. Um, uh, I don't want to dwell on it too much. We'll get into specifics. Uh, I'd prefer to do that, but uh, I suppose I should give an overview. Mm -hmm. Right. This is kind of the the one-liner. Uh, I condensed it as down as best I could. So what it's saying is there's kind of three parts to this in terms of my objective or our objective for this module. Sorry, not. Just give me one sec. Uh, the first part is uh, this module is about designing and implementing client-side rendering web apps. Now I need to explain what I mean by client-side rendering web apps. I'll do that uh, in, a, in a few moments. The second part of the module or of this statement talks about uh, talks about deploying deploying these client side rendering web apps, deploying them uh, on a serverless platform. Uh, that's kind of a second aspect of it, which we look at. In fact, we'll probably be looking at that in the first half of the module. And the third part of this sentence, bit of a loaded sentence now, but, but the third part talks about automating the provisioning of the resources required uh, on our serverless platform. So there are those three aspects, I guess, client-side rendering, web apps, serverless platform, automated provisioning. That's what's gonna make up this module. It's a very practical-based module, um, as, you, as you will gather as we work our way through it. I'm going, I'm going to explain a little bit about client-side rendering uh, in this set of slides. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of serverless uh, somewhere along the lines. Uh, we will just put a little bit of flesh on that. Uh, you may have actually practiced some serverless uh, deployment. I don't know. And you may have also come across the notion of automated provisioning. Uh, certainly any of you that studied the 
cloud architecture module in the first semester would have come across this idea of automated provisioning. You would have used uh, cloud formation. Um, we will use something else though. I'm conscious of the fact that uh, many of you have studied the cloud architecture module. Some of you haven't though. So I, I hopefully try and balance uh, both of those groups um, within this module as best I can. But I'm, I'm hoping that you have some, um, well, we'll see. I was going to say you have some familiarity with AWS, but uh, again, some of you may not have, and I'm trying to, we'll try and accommodate that as well. So that's kind of the uh, uh, headline in terms of what we want to do here. Um, okay. Let's talk a little bit about web apps and the architecture of web apps. So the very first generation of web apps were classified, or we can classify them today, although the term didn't exist back then, back then being probably the early, uh, the very early noughties, uh, and even before that, maybe the very late nineties, uh, they would be classified as server-side rendering web apps. Um, as I said, that term didn't exist back then, but today it does exist because we have different architectures. But the the notion of uh, or the idea behind server side rendering web apps, I'm trying to get it across here in in my picture. Like I, on the left, I have my my client, which is really my browser. Uh, in the middle, I have uh, a server. This is not serverless now for the moment, anyway. And on the right, we have a database, and we the server is doing everything. So I'm saying here that the server is responsible for generating the user interface. It's responsible for doing any kind of number crunching or algorithms, algorithm, algorithms associated with uh, whatever the nature of the functionality of this web application is. Any data processing, it's taking care of all of that. It's, it does it all really. In particular, uh, we're saying that it is actually responsible for generating the UI dynamically. So as the user over here on the left, uh, once they load, the web app in once they kind of navigate to the web app, the very first request that goes to the server, it'll generate the kind of the home page. It'll generate the actual HTML and CSS, send it down. A uh, browser will display it. The user clicks a link on that, let's say, or uh, enters the uh, text into a text box and hits return. Or if it happens to be a web form, they fill out the web form, click submit. For either of those three interactions, clicking the hyperlinks, filling in a text field and hitting return or filling out a form uh, and hitting return for either of those three scenarios. Uh, the next thing that happens is that the, the browser is going to actually just communicate back to the server the fact that the user has interacted and the server does its thing. It processes that request, if you like, and it generates the UI and sends it back to the browser again. And the browser now displays the new page based on the user interaction. It could be the same page with slight differences to it, but the server is going to generate the entire uh, restructured uh, page, if you like. So the, 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 sorry, the server is going to generate the, the, the page and it's, it's always doing that. That was the nature of server side, as in the, the server, if you take the name, the server was rendering the actual user interface. So that was the first generation of web apps. The next generation, which is what we're interested in, are client-side rendering web apps. And you can see now in my picture that there's a, a slightly better distribution of the workload that's going on here. Now the browser is actually responsible for generating the UI. Okay. Um, so there's actually quite a lot of JavaScript uh, loaded into the browser. It'll be loaded by the server, admittedly. And that JavaScript is now actually going to be responsible for dynamically at runtime generating the user interface. So generating the various uh, views uh, based again on the user interaction. And so the, the interactive, the majority of the communication between this, the, the browser stroke client and the server is now in the form of data being sent in this direction or data being sent in the uh, uh, other direction. So that's, uh, I'm calling that the second generation, I'm not too sure if it's strictly speaking second generation or not. The interesting thing is though that, okay, certainly server-side rendering was the first generation, 
but server-side rendering web apps have become very popular within the last, let's say, five or six years again. So there is a swing back towards server-side rendering. Client-side rendering is still really important. And there's also a mixture of client and server-side rendering. So the, the kind of the, the architecture is evolving for sure. Uh, here's an, uh, so we, we'll just uh, uh, focus in on client-side rendering or CSR. This is another way of viewing what's going on now in a client-side rendering web app. And what I'm getting across here is that potentially there are actually two servers at play here. The server at the top, all it is responsible for is sending the initial JavaScript down to the browser. So the way these work now is my user uh, enters the URL of the web app. That request, that URL is going to be directed to these, this static. It's just a static web server. It's an ordinary plain old web server. And the web server is going to grab uh, the assets, which will be a combination of JavaScript, uh, maybe some CSS, and a tiny bit of HTML, very little though. In fact, it will usually be a a, a shell uh, web page, and it sends those back down to the browser. There's a lot of JavaScript code though in this uh, response. And the JavaScript code runs in the browser, and it actually generates the opening page, if you like, of the opening view of the web app. And the user interacts then, again, as I was saying a while ago, the user clicks on a hyperlink if there is a hyperlink available. If there is some sort of data entry required, it does the data entry. Uh, if, there's a, if it's a web form, it fills out the web form. And in each of those three cases, the request now, when they hit return, if you like, now the communication is down to the server here. And this server, uh, based on the request, um, it will may communicate with the database, get some data, send some data back to the browser. The browser, then the JavaScript here, takes that data and kind of stitches it into uh, the web page and generates an updated web page. And the communication from there on in, any interaction by the user now from there on in, will either involve JavaScript uh, doing some processing locally and updating the view that's being displayed back to the user, or it will communicate with this server down here, either send data down to the server, which it processes and maybe updates the database and sends back some sort of response in the form of data, or just a straightforward response saying, that's okay, I've received that. Uh, and the JavaScript processes that response accordingly. Or the request from the browser to the server will essentially be get some data for me or compute some data for me. And it does that com computation and responds back with, with data. And again, the JavaScript takes the response and makes the necessary changes to the view that it's going to display back to the user. So the key thing is there's a lot of JavaScript code inside here and it is responsible for dynamically at runtime generating what the user sees. And this is the type of web apps that we are concentrating on in this module. Uh, the server up here then has no has no role after the initial uh, um, after the initial kind of uh, uploading uh, sorry downloading of the assets as I'm calling them to the browser. The server down here, we refer to it as a, a web API server. And so we are going to be interested in developing the kind of code that runs in, in this server, although we will be deploying that code onto a serverless platform. Serverless doesn't mean there isn't a server. All it means is we don't, we are not responsible for um, spinning up a server as such. But that's for another day. So Web API is the is is kind of a wrapper for a piece of some functionality that is responsible for data processing, algorithm implementation, data validation, all that kind of stuff.
all I'm showing you here then is again kind of uh, uh, a, a kind of a, 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 a diagrammatic representation of the communication flow that I was describing on the previous slide. The initial communication is from the browser to the the server at the top, which is the HTTP server, the ordinary web server. It responds back with the various web assets. Browser uses those assets to generate a view. And then from there on in, any interaction that the user has with the view, that will trigger typically the browser to send a request to my web API server, either a GET request or a POST request. Is there a POST request somewhere? A POST request, some sort of um, either requesting data or sending data down to the server, to the web API server, does its thing and responds back uh, accordingly. The server then here, as we can see, has no other role uh, from the initial uh, part of the plate. Uh, client side rendering web apps. So I'm dating them back to around the early noughties. Okay, so the very first Gmail was a client side rendering web app. But these client side rendering web apps have evolved over the years. The very first generation of client side rendering web apps were just all JavaScript code. There was no third party libraries. Uh, so we we're kind of in the early days of the JavaScript language, if you like. There was little or no third party JavaScript libraries available to us like there is today. There's hundreds of them available to us today. So, you know, as a developer, you had to write a heck of a lot of JavaScript. And there was no well understood patterns that uh, were recommended for developers to use. So we tended to fin finish up with very unmaintainable, hard to read. Uh, spaghetti code essentially so it lacked a lot i'm also saying that the very first generation of these client-side rendering web apps they lacked addressability addressability is, is this one of these core um, principles of the web itself you know in, the, in an ordinary static website as we click on hyperlinks we navigate from page to page just in an ordinary website now not a web app uh, but every time we go to a new page the url in the browser changes so each page has its own unique address, its own unique URL. That's what addressability is in the context of the web. Now, the thing with the very first generation of these client-side rendering web apps, we still had hyperlinks available to us and we clicked on these hyperlinks, but clicking up a hyperlink was just something that was uh, intercepted by the JavaScript code and it did some processing. The actual URL in the browser never changed. So as we moved around different parts of our web app, the browser's URL did not change. And that was considered a weakness really uh, of the web app. Because if I wanted to share a, a particular view within a web app with somebody, I could not send them a, a unique URL that, that caused the other person's browser to go directly to the page that I wanted them to see within the web app. So that was a, a, a weakness, although it wasn't considered a major weakness at the time, but that, that problem has, has now been resolved. Anyway, in terms of the what happened over time, the next major um, milestone in the history of client-side rendering web apps was the introduction of a single library called the jQuery library. It was really phenomenal in the, in its usefulness for developers because the jQuery library essentially reduced the, the volume of code that we had to write as developers. Uh, so it was, it was less JavaScript code, whereas up here I'm saying, you know, we had to write a heck of a lot of JavaScript code. So jQuery took care of an awful lot of things for a standard kind of uh, issues like cross-browser, uh, cross-browser, uh, um, cross-platform, I'm talking about here, cross-platform uh, uh, miss of our web app. We, you know, we'd like our web app to run in any browser, not be specific to a browser. And that wasn't the case up here. You know, we had to, essentially in our JavaScript code, we had to detect what, what type is the browser that I'm running in and then run one piece of code if it's browser type A, run another piece of code if it's browser type B. So you, you, the developer, had to manage all of that, whereas uh, 
Uh, now jQuery did it. And but jQuery did lots of other things as well. It made lots of other aspects of uh, client-side rendering, web app development easier. Uh, we still had the addressability issue though. Um, now, whereas initially, and for a number of years, perhaps even decade, but certainly a number of years, jQuery was, uh, as I said, extremely popular, extremely beneficial to the developer community. But it it still resulted in us producing uh, fairly unmaintainable code, uh, as well as the lack of addressability. The code itself was was quite difficult to uh, to manage uh, and understand. And for those various defects, uh, we had the next iteration was the introduction of frameworks to the uh, CSR web app development uh, um, area. And we refer to these frameworks as client as uh, single page app frameworks. I won't go into explaining where that name comes from. It'll be explained when we actually start looking at one of them. Uh, so these single page app frameworks, so I'm dating them to around 2010, 2011, that kind of fish period. So about 10 years after, uh, of the very first client-side rendering web apps. And they solved the addressability problem for us. And they also reduced the volume of code that we had to write. They also enforced uh, a structure on our code, uh, which meant that code was presumably more maintainable and readable. And the, the very first one was a framework called Backbone, I think. It was probably the first uh, single page app framework. Not really used that much at, anymore. In fact, it's definitely not used at all anymore. Um, uh, there were a number of other notable ones like Angular uh, was also a, a kind of a revolutionary single page app framework. React is the one that we are going to look at, uh, which again, it's been around since about 2013, 2014. So it's quite old, but it's... Um, Popularity persists, though. Uh, so that's the one, the specific one that we look at. And there are newer ones than, than React that are also quite popular, like Svelte and Solid would be two notable ones. And each each of these frameworks kind of looked at the its predecessors and tried to make improvements uh, on them, obviously enough, I guess. But React has stood the test of time, it's fair to say. So that's kind of the that's the whole context, if you like, uh, for this module or one part of it. I know the the client side rendering. I've explained in very brief terms. I know what client side rendering web apps are all about. Um, in terms of this module, if we go back to this diagram, uh, uh, there are kind of two parts to it, really, if you like. In terms of the the client side functionality, the stuff that's going to run inside the browser. As I've already alluded to, we are going to be using uh, a single page app framework called the React framework. <clears throat> and really all that framework is in very simple terms is it's a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. It's only it's really only for user interfaces. You, you wouldn't tend to put a lot of behavior or you shouldn't bury a lot of um, functionality inside a single page app framework, the functionality really needs to reside on the server side. Uh, so uh, we're going to be using React anyway as our single page uh, app framework or our framework for rendering the UI part of a web app. On the other side then, on the kind of, well, I, 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 can't, I have to use the word server site, even though we're talk, we, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, we're going to be looking at something called serverless. But as I said, serverless does not mean there is no server. There always has to be a server. It just means we don't uh, manage or maintain the server uh, platform. But on the server side, that's where we're going to focus on the AWS platform. So all of our web API stuff is going to be deployed onto the AWS platform. Uh, boom, 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 provides, oh yeah, okay. That's fine. This is uh, an outline 
of how things are going to flow through this module. So starting on the bottom left, we, by the way, I haven't said, uh, although it's, it's probably clear from if you if you looked at all at the uh, the website that I gave you, um, that we are actually going to be using TypeScript uh, a lot in this module uh, as opposed to JavaScript. I'm not certain whether Frank, who's going to be taking care of the client side, the React stuff, uh, I'm not certain whether he is going to use TypeScript or JavaScript. He, he, he's yet to finalize that for himself. But I'm going to be using it, uh, in fact, on the web API, the server side stuff that we're going to be uh, developing. And my assumption, our assumption is everybody probably has done some JavaScript programming or certainly uh, would be comfortable doing any JavaScript programming. So I am going to give you a quick kind of crash course on TypeScript. Uh, but the assumption is that you're already familiar with JavaScript. And so all really TypeScript is, is a kind of superset of JavaScript. So we'll spend about a week or two on that. Then we'll start to get the web API stuff. And that's where we will flesh out uh, this whole area of serverless. And we'll also flesh out uh, automated provisioning on the in the cloud. Uh, and as well, we'll, we'll be talking about some you know, generic cloud-related stuff. So uh, that's fine. And then we move on to the client side. That's where we react. And at the very end, then, obviously, we need to integrate our client and our server-side code. Uh, so that will hopefully come in at the end where we cover stuff like uh, user account management and authentication and maybe um, content delivery network CDNs uh, depends really on how we how we how how much time we have available to us uh, at the end here. So this is very much a little bit of guesswork at this stage for us because we have made some fairly significant changes to this module in comparison to let's say what we taught last year and the way we taught it last year uh, and the order in which we taught things last year. So I'm not certain how much I'm saying here. There's, there'll be two weeks available for this integration section. Uh, but there may be only one week. Hopefully, there'll be at least one week, but we'll have to see. Okay, so the module is all about uh, developing single-page apps, which is the using React, which is on the client side, and then using serverless as the platform for developing the web API stuff using various AWS services. What software do you need uh, on your local machines uh, for this module? Again, I think I might have mentioned one or two uh, in the message. You're going to need to... Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm going to be... I, I use VS Code. Uh, some of you may be very familiar with VS Code already. VS Code is a... Strictly speaking, it's only a text editor, but it's probably would be more appropriate to call it an IDE, though it didn't begin live as an IDE. Uh, but it's the editor stroke IDE that we that I will use throughout, and Frank will use throughout this module. It's not mandatory that you use it. If you're more comfortable with some other one, that's okay. But uh, if you come across any issues, you're gonna, you're going to have to solve them yourself. Uh, this is possibly, uh, but I I would highly recommend getting some familiarity with VS Code because it's, it's extremely popular in the industry. And it's a very simple installation, really. Uh, number two, you're going to need to install Node.js locally. Now, the screenshot was taken a couple of uh, couple of days ago, so the, make sure uh, if you haven't got Node.js already on your uh, laptop stroke desktop uh, and you do need to install it, make sure you take the version, it'll change slightly. It almost changes kind of on a week-to-week -week basis. Take the version that's it categorizes as the, uh, what term does it use? You see the one over here, it for, refers to this as the current one, which I think is very misleading. But the current one is is more, is experimental. Uh, and we want to stay away from that. Pick the one that's stable. It's probably the word I was using for but. Well, as they say, it's recommended here, but this is the stable version of Node. This is the more experimental. I think they use the word current here was a bad choice on their part, but anyway. So make sure you pick the one on the left. Now, on my own 
laptop, I am using version 18. And that may seem like a long, uh, a very old one, but version 18 was the one that was recommended, I guess, about maybe five months ago. So it's not that out of date, really. But I'm sure version 20 will be fine um, for what we do. Although, like I said, any stuff that I cover will have been tested off version 18. I might try and uh, test the stuff off version 20 as we work our way through it. I don't foresee any problems really with, uh, with famous last words. I don't foresee any problems if you have version 20. Uh, we'll use Git really as just a resource uh, and you need to install it if you don't have it. Pretty much every laptop probably has Git automatically installed. So just type git minus version on your command line to see if it is installed or not on your machine. And uh, just do your Google search to install it if you do need to. We'll also be using GitHub. Uh, you'll be using GitHub for any of your assignment submissions and you should use GitHub to back up any code uh, or the code that we develop in the labs. Uh, the nice thing about VS Code, one of the one of the nice many nice things about VS Code is that you can open up what's called an integrated terminal within the editor because we will be using the command prompt to type certain commands and rather than switching between VS Code and the normal terminal uh, prompt which is outside of the editor, we can do it all within the editor. Um, prerequisites. Uh, if you haven't already, you need to create an AW, uh, an account on the AWS platform for yourself. So just, uh, do I have it already opened up, I wonder? So again, like I say, some of you may not have done any AWS stuff, but just uh, do a, just go to AWS, this, this website here, and just sign up. Now you will need a credit card to sign up and because of the nature of what we are going to be doing, which is this uh, serverless stuff, the cost that we're going to incur will be very, very minimal. We do need to keep an eye on it though, but if you follow the instructions that I give you, then there will be very, very minimal costs. For those of you that did do the cloud architecture module in last semester, you would have used the AWS Academy uh, accounts. I think Richard and Jimmy created accounts for you on the AWS Academy. Now, unfortunately, that does not work for us because the kind of stuff that we are going to be doing, the, the AWS Academy accounts are not sufficiently privileged to allow us to do what we want to do. So that's why you will need to create your own personal AWS account. But like I said, uh, I don't foresee us incurring more than Ten dollars, uh, or maybe maximum of fifteen dollars, absolute maximum, uh, throughout this module. I would, uh, I'd be interested to see at the end of the module to see <laughs> who has incurred the most and the least cost. But I, I, it's it's really going to be minimal, so I would not be worried about that, provided you follow uh, our instructions. So that's it, uh, create an AWS account for yourself. You're also going to need to install the AWS CLI. Now I should have probably, but if you just do a Google on AWS CLI install, the very first link will take you to a page on the AWS documentation and it steps you through installing the CLI on your local uh, on your local machine. And it, it gives you the instructions for a Mac versus Windows versus Linux. So it covers all the, all the grounds. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you should be able to follow the instructions yourselves and uh, it should work fine for you. On the right, then I'm just showing you how do you know whether the CLI has installed properly or not. Usual story, really just if you type this command here, uh, it should come back with something meaningful. I don't care what specific version of the CLI you have installed, provided it is version 2 dot something, 2 dot X. Uh, so if you already have the CLI installed, well, if you installed it last semester with the uh, in the cloud architecture module, it'll definitely be version 2.x. But if it happens to have been installed 
maybe when you bought the machine, it may be one dot something, and that is too old. So you will need to upgrade to a newer version of the CLI. Uh, yeah, this is just the version of Node that I happen to have running when I typed these commands. Uh, but like I said, I've already covered that stuff. Version 20, I'm sure will be fine. I am seeing here familiarity with the AWS Management Console. Now, don't worry that the, the Cloud Architecture module will be very familiar with the Management Console. Uh, those of you that didn't and haven't done any AWS stuff won't be, but we'll try and um, we will try to explain how this console can be useful to us as we're doing our development. And I, I will be, you know, dem demonstrating using the console anyway in the lectures. So we can, for those of you that are not, that are not familiar with it, you'll be straightforward enough for you to pick up how we can use this AWS Management Console to uh, help us when we're doing any kind of debugging or confirming that certain things have deployed properly for us or not. Uh, we could have we could have called this module full stack development. Full stack development is in in truth it's it's a more modern term than talking about client side rendering and server side rendering. Um, uh, so you, we could just as well say that the purpose one, the, the focus of this module is uh, full stack client side rendering web app development. Now, full stack makes no reference to serverless or automated provisioning, uh, but it, it's it's full stack in the sense that we're looking at the client side, the server side, and the database side. Oh yeah, the 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 other point from this. Uh, from the image really is, uh, we know now at this stage that our client side is going to be implemented in React. Our server side, albeit on a serverless platform, is going to involve using Node, and it's going to involve using something called Lambda, which is a one of AWS's serverless services. We'll talk a lot about that uh, in a couple of weeks' time. The database that we're going to be using is another AWS serverless service called DynamoDB. DynamoDB is a serverless, non-relational database. The module is 100% CA. Um, there will be two assignments, a backend, or probably I should have used backend rather than server side uh, because backend is more uh, is is it's not specific to the to the platform. So there'll be a, a an assignment focusing on the back end or the web API, and there'll be an assignment focusing on the front end. And the front end one also incorporates the integration of your front end and back end, which is why it has a heavier weighting. Uh let's see. All right, that's just a summary slide, which I won't talk uh, through. All right, uh, I'm just going to pause for a minute, give you a chance if there are any questions that come to your mind at this stage. Feel free to ask me. No? Okay, let's, uh, let's start learning something new. So I want to go into the first topic, which is TypeScript. Uh, so sorry, as, uh, as we work our way through this module now, we'll be adding new cards, uh, maybe every week or uh, every second week, depending on what the how much stuff is in each topic. But um, and behind each card, the the structure is really the same. There'll be a set of slides. There'll be lab work. Okay, it says homework here, but that's really lab work. And there may or may not be an archive. Now, I noticed there about uh, an hour ago that when we click on this, that's what we get. <laughs> it doesn't work. So the archive that's behind this card, I will uh, give it to you via Slack. I'll do that after the lecture. 
because uh, we use I'll, I'll be working talking my way through this the code in this archive it, it's a typescript small little typescript um package really or, or project whatever you want to call it and demonstrating various aspects of the typescript language so it's important really that you he can get access to that and just play around with it really so i'll do that after the lecture the labs then uh if we click our we just you know we, we work our way through the various stages in the lab and the labs are very prescriptive so you won't need very little and perhaps no hand holding as you work your way through the lab they're, they're written uh such that you can pretty much work on your own uh, but certainly of course we're, we're available for any questions that you might have during the lab sessions or if uh, on occasions if you want to ask us something over slack outside the lab hours although i can't guarantee how quickly you'll get a response but we depends on whether we're online or not okay let's go to Oh yeah, and this one here then, as the name suggests, this is where we'll, uh, we will put the recordings uh, for each lecture. So I think there at the moment, that'll be updated later on today or tomorrow. So uh, I want to start working my way through these slides here, and I certainly won't get through all of them uh, today. And there's no need for you uh, you can if you want to, but there's, you know if you go through, if you follow through, then all you're getting is a PDF really, and you can work your way through it. But I have it in PowerPoint form, so it might be a little bit easier for us to follow uh, on the screen rather than you following on the website. Now I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for one second while I lower those. Again, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to shout out. If I just go back again to the website, sorry. Um, When you do eventually, when, when I give you the archive uh, behind this card here, uh, you unzip it and import it into VS Code. And what you will see is, uh, is this. So there's various little TypeScript files with some illustration illustrating some part of the typescript language and i'm going to step my way through through that you're not sharing your screen oh well done well done <laughs> that won't be the last time that'll happen i'd say uh let's see So what I was saying was um, when I eventually give you access to the archive uh, behind this card, you download it, you unzip it. And when you unzip it, just import it into VS Code. And by the way, the way you, uh, maybe I should do that from the very start actually, because some of you may not have used VS Code at all. What if I just close off all of that? When you start up VS Code, that's what you get initially. And when I say import something, it's simply a drag and drop. So in this case, uh, when you unzip the archive, what you get is a folder like this, and you just drag and drop. And uh, you can see that I it's. Um, First of all, it's a it's a node project. How do I know it's a node project? Because we have a package.json file. 
in it. And whenever you see a package.json, um, uh, what the package.json includes in it uh, is metadata about the project, including what third party libraries you need to install. And in our case, we want to install these two third party libraries, which are TypeScript related. So the very first thing you do uh, from the command line, the command line is down here now on the bottom. This is what's called an integrated terminal. Um, you just type uh, npm install. It says it in the readme anyway. The readme says the very first thing you should do is type npm install. Oh, when you do that, it installs the third party libraries and it installs them locally inside in a subfolder called the node modules folder. You don't ever need to go into the node modules folder, but it's in there. That's where they are. Um, right. Just bear with me for a second. Oh, yeah, that's okay. So let's start talking about the TypeScript language. So the slides I'm about to look at are these slides here. And if you, sorry, if you click on that, what you get is a PDF version of them. And by just hitting the left arrow, right arrow, you can flick through them. Now, rather than you having to do that on the website, it's easier for you just to follow me on the screen because I have them in a, I'll, I'll illustrate them uh, through PowerPoint. Okay, so we wanna talk about uh, the TypeScript language. This is just some needless, <laughs> if I was to be honest, needless uh, kind of marketing, I call it information about TypeScript, which you can read and then uh, duly forget. Um, so the language itself has been around since, what am I saying there, 2010 or so? But it's not really until about 2016, 2017 that its popularity has really started to catch on. But either way, anyway, it's a language that was designed by the people in Microsoft, although specifically by this individual here, who is the same person that designed the C Sharp language. So very good pedigree. Um, it's an open source language. Uh, it's based, uh, if, if you've done any JavaScript, you may have heard of something called ECMAScript. ECMAScript is the specification for the JavaScript language. Uh, put another way, JavaScript is an, is an implementation of the ECMAScript specification. And the ECMAScript specification, the very first version of it was back around 90, 1990, I guess. And there have been updates to that specification over the years. So uh, I don't know where we are at where we are at at the moment, but version four of the specification was the very early noughties. Version six of the specification was 2015. And what this guy, uh, its creator, did was he looked at specifically uh, version four of the ECMAScript specification and version six and use those as a basis for defining this new language, which we now know as TypeScript. Uh, what is TypeScript? If you've read anything at all about TypeScript, you'll know that it is a superset of JavaScript. What that means is that all JavaScript that you write is automatically TypeScript. Uh, what TypeScript though is it has some additional syntax uh, layered on top of your JavaScript. Uh, so I'm saying here that we still write JavaScript. When we're writing TypeScript, we're, we're still writing JavaScript, but we augment it with, uh, with extra syntax. Um, in, for example, we can add classes. We can define classes in our TypeScript code, which we can also do in our JavaScript code, as you know. Uh, and classes were introduced in ES6 of the JavaScript language and Pretty much any language now that doesn't have classes isn't worth its salt really. So uh, TypeScript does, but also what TypeScript has that JavaScript does not have is TypeScript has a structured type system associated with it. And the structured type system that comes with the TypeScript language was actually based on version four of the ECMAScript. Now, you, you don't need to remember that stuff. If I was to be uh, quite 
uh, honest with you, but anyway, that's that's the history of it. Moving on. Uh, TypeScript really is only a compiled time language. You cannot run TypeScript code. There isn't a runtime specifically for the TypeScript language. Uh, you, you write TypeScript code, but when you compile it, and you do have to compile it, what the compiler outputs is plain old vanilla JavaScript. And then you run that JavaScript code. You run it either in a browser or uh, using the Node platform or whatever other JavaScript runtimes are available to you. So you're always falling back to JavaScript. Uh, that's fine. Uh, moving on. Bernard Icke, if you have read, if you know anything about the history of JavaScript, Bernard Icke is the creator of JavaScript, and he has he's obviously impressed by the TypeScript language. And one particular part of the language that he liked is this area called type inferencing, which we'll talk about in a little while. And it's really without type inferencing, it's possible that the TypeScript language wouldn't have become as popular as it has. Uh, and put and you see what I mean by that when we explain it. Another notable individual in the JavaScript world. I'm not as familiar with this person, but uh, he was looks like he was particularly impressed by what he's saying here. Is he's impressed by the things that have been left out of the TypeScript language. Um, what's he saying specifically? Uh, doesn't do. Uh, sorry, now I'm just reading it. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I, I said there that you write TypeScript code and then you compile it and it outputs, the compiler outputs JavaScript code. But there's a lot of the syntax and the, the meaning of the syntax that's included in TypeScript. It never actually materializes into anything in the JavaScript code. And again, I'll, I'll explain uh, what I mean by that, uh, I guess, when we start to look at the language. TypeScript was really, uh, the, 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 it was really developed for large scale application development. If you're writing a small application, then you probably find just writing it in JavaScript. But if it's a large application, that's when the, the, aspects of TypeScript become really beneficial to your developer experience. Uh, now, we are not going to be writing large applications for sure, but that was the I, thinking behind the creator of the language. Uh, and really, it was, it was also motivated by the typical types of problems that developers have when they're developing large applications in JavaScript, uh, trying to solve uh, the types of problems that the developers have. And TypeScript uh, certainly does that. So I grabbed this uh, there a couple of days ago. Uh, every year, GitHub does a survey on the popularity of various languages on its platform. In other words, you know, the number of repositories, et cetera, on the GitHub platform that are uh, dedicated to a specific language or implemented in a specific language. And so for years and years and years, JavaScript has been number one and still is. But it, look, if you look here, TypeScript has actually uh, risen to position number three, whereas last year it was on position number two. So even in the last 12 months, uh, its popularity uh, has grown. But I mean, if you follow the TypeScript plot in this, it really only entered the GitHub, uh, the GitHub um, uh, kind of charts, if you like, back in 2017. So it's still a very new language relative to all the other ones. I mean, JavaScript has been around since uh, around 1990, 1991. Uh, Java, Python, they're also extremely uh, old languages or have been around for a long, long time. Uh, whereas TypeScript is a very new language, but it has already risen up to position number three in this um, popularity kind of test uh, chart. 
And to be honest, that is mainly because JavaScript is number one. So really, anybody that's doing any kind of web development today, they are more than likely not doing the development in JavaScript. They are doing it in TypeScript, and certainly for large applications, but even small applications. So it has uh, taken over, I think it would be fair to say, in the web world, almost from JavaScript itself. But of course, we know, we already know that TypeScript anyway is JavaScript with some extra uh, bells and whistles added to it. So TypeScript is uh, really good to have on your CV, I guess is the other point that I'm trying to get from that, uh, this slide. Let's get into some of the specifics. Uh, a TypeScript file, uh, by convention anyway, the file extension is .ts, so that's where you, you find source code, TypeScript source code. There are also what are called declaration files, and their, uh, their file extension is .d.ts, and these declaration files are similar to header files in C and C++. The, the declaration files, they don't contain any executable source code. They contain declarations of data types that are specific to your uh, application. And we'll see examples of that in a while. Uh, so they provide, I'm saying here, they provide type definitions uh, uh, and they're separate from the source code. And, but you import these, you import these type declarations into your source code, your source code being your .ts files. Also, you know, okay, there's an awful lot of really, really good third-party JavaScript libraries out there. Now, it would be a disaster if we could not use those third-party JavaScript libraries in our TypeScript projects, and we can. And one of the reasons we can use them is because the creators of those third-party JavaScript libraries, they've actually added these declaration, these TypeScript declaration files to the library, which allows us to use them within our TypeScript project. Uh, that's the point that I'm making here. Also, uh, also, you know, the including VS Code, all the various tooling around TypeScript, it makes heavy use of these declaration files. Uh, and we'll see what I mean by that when we start playing around with the language. So they are they're very important. Uh, we may not we may not write a lot of declaration files, but we'll see it mainly where we'll see it mainly is in the third party libraries that we use. Not directly, but indirectly, they're they're there. We don't necessarily go poking around them because they're they're quite large things. Any language, if we start now focusing on the language, any language has what we might call its primitive types, and they're no different for TypeScript than any other language. So the primitive types in the TypeScript language are the number type. Uh, it doesn't make a distinction between integers and floats. There's just a number type. Uh, it has a Boolean primitive type. It has a string primitive type. Uh, again, there's in TypeScript anyway, there's no distinction between single quoted and double quoted strings. It has the the null value, I suppose, or type. It's kind of interchangeable. Uh, and we've probably all come across null in other languages that we have uh, programmed in. And it, it means the same thing in TypeScript. So if you want to assign uh, if you want to declare a variable but not assign it, assign it a specific value, then you could initialize it to the null value. Uh, it also has the undefined type. Now, if you've done any programming in JavaScript, you will be very familiar with the undefined type. It's slightly uh, badly named uh, where the undefined type, and I'm saying it's a type, but it's also a value. If you declare a variable and you do not initialize it, in JavaScript, by default, it assigns the undefined value to that variable. So it's a value um, and it's a type, but th there's only one value that that type can have. <laughs> it's a bit of a tongue twister called the undefined type. Um, and apart from those primitive types, then 
The language natively has classes, it has modules, it has interfaces. Um, I'm putting these all under the bracket of objects, but I don't like the use of the word object there because an object means something very uh, particular in the JavaScript world. But anyway, we have classes and we know what classes are from other languages. We have modules, we know what they are from other languages. Interfaces are the same as interfaces in Java or uh, C++. Um, literal types I'll come back to. Uh, TypeScript supports typed arrays, which is something that we didn't have in JavaScript, and we'll have an example of that in a second. Now, the 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 uh, the, the the types the 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 predefined types that come with the language they form they form a kind of hierarchy, uh, and at the very top of that hierarchy there is a type called the any type. So every variable that you ever declare, uh, it inherits the fact that its type, it has the any type. Uh, but uh, other types like primitive types now, for example, they are subordinate to the any type. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't want to get too bogged down in this any type, but anyway, it's, uh, it is at the top of the, uh, the type hierarchy that comes with the TypeScript language. We will actually, we may actually see uh, in the code that we write at certain stages when we check to see, well, I've got a variable here, what type is it? And the compiler will tell me its type is the any type, which essentially means it can have any value assigned to it. Uh, I'm saying all types uh, are subordinate to this singular top type in the type system. Uh, right, let's move on. Let's look at some specifics of the syntax. And the first part of TypeScript's syntax that you need to be aware of is what we call type annotations. And a type annotation is, uh, it's how you declare what type a variable is. And the type associated with a variable dictates the values that that variable can have. Now I'm saying it's optional here, uh, but it's only optional in the sense that if you do not explicitly state the type of the variable, then the compiler will infer the type for you. And that inference might be correct in men, in most cases. It may not be. If it's not, then you should be explicit about it. You should be, you see, you as you probably know, the JavaScript language, we would classify it as a dynamically typed language. What that means is, in JavaScript now, what it means is when you declare a variable, you can assign any value to that variable at any stage. So on line X, I might assign a string to the variable. On line X plus one, I might assign a number, a numeric value to that variable. And as far as JavaScript is concerned, there's nothing wrong with that because variables are dynamically typed. Now that has great benefits, but it also has huge uh, downsides to it. And really what TypeScript is trying to do uh, and achieves is to get rid of that dynamic typing nature that is in, that is ingrained in JavaScript. And it is that dynamic uh, that dynamic typing, that is the source of pretty much all errors that you come across when you run JavaScript code. So, um, so this type annotation uh, I'm seeing here, it's a lightweight way to record the intent, uh, the intended contact uh, uh, of a variable. In other words, how do you intend to use the variable in the sense of what do you intend to assign to that variable, the types of values you intend to assign to it. We also use type annotations with functions, which we'll see later on. Um, the syntax is this uh, postfix syntax. So this is how we, this is our first uh, TypeScript statement. We're declaring a variable called me, and I'm stating that the type of this variable is a string, which means at any stage within the runtime of this 
code, uh, the only values that I can assign to the B variables are string are string values. Uh, now at this stage, I can flip over to my archive. And if I expand the SRC folder and go into the 00 basics subfolder and look at the index.ts. So at the very top, uh, we have examples of simple usage of type annotation. So here I'm declaring, again, a string. Here I'm declaring a variable and its type is number. Uh, in both cases, I'm using primitive types for now. That's all we know about. Uh, of course, the whole point of typing uh, or using type annotations is if I uncomment this line, uh, I'm trying to assign I'm trying to assign a string to a variable that I have declared to be a number. And straight away, uh, it's really the TypeScript compiler that's complaining behind the scenes because the TypeScript compiler is always monitoring what's going on uh, within VS Code anyway. It's monitoring what's going on in my code as I type it. And it's warning me straight away, you've got a problem here. Now, when you're doing any TypeScript development within VS Code, uh, always have this problems tab uh, open, if you like. So if I just click on it, uh, it's explaining the error that you have up here. Now, it's fairly obvious what the error is, but, you know, it's telling you you've got a type string and you cannot assign to it. And sorry, we've got a type string is not assignable to a type number. Is in, you know, you, you cannot assign a string to a variable that you've declared as being of type number. And so you fix it straight away. Now, the thing is that in JavaScript, if we if this was JavaScript code, of course, we wouldn't have the uh, type annotations. But in JavaScript, it's not until we run the code and we start using this variable, uh, we start using it as, let's say, we think it's a numeric variable, even though you know we've, we've assigned a string to it. We start using it as a numeric variable and we start doing arithmetic operations with it. And at some stage, our runtime is just going to crash because it's, it can't do carry out certain arithmetic operations on the variable because it doesn't have a numeric value assigned to it. That's what happens typically with your JavaScript development. Whereas now with TypeScript, uh, we, we've been uh, warned about this and it's stronger than a warning, really. It just won't compile for us. Uh, it's being highlighted straight away that we are assigning an invalid value to a variable. Okay, here it's a straightforward assignment statement, but this would apply as well if, you know, further on in my runtime execution, I try to make this assignment. So that's uh, type annotations, this uh, post-fix syntax. Uh, let's see, anything else? Uh, in this example here, right, another illustration of the, you know, what's really nice about TypeScript and the fact that it warns you about silly things, essentially, that you're trying to do in your code. It doesn't make sense, but you're, you're getting the warning at, at development time rather than runtime. If I uncomment this line here, so again, my number is, has been declared as a variable of type number. Uh, to uppercase, as you may know, is a method that you can source that you can assign or that you can invoke on a string variable. You certainly cannot, cannot invoke it on a numeric variable. And again, the compiler has, has spotted that mistake on your part. It's warning you that you're trying to, okay, it calls it, it's down here. It says that the property to string, it's saying it's a property. We know it really as a, as a method of, um, a string type, but it doesn't exist. The touch to uppercase does not exist on variables of type uh, number. Similarly here, you know, if you try and carry out an arithmetic operation, 
uh, on a Boolean, because I've declared my Boolean here as being a variable of type Boolean. It doesn't make sense to carry out an arithmetic operation on a Boolean variable, and the compiler is, com is complaining about that. And yet again, if this was plain JavaScript code, though, uh, you're not going to discover that you're doing something silly to a Boolean variable until runtime. Okay, so uh, what I'm saying here is that there's, there's really good intelligence uh, available to us as, as we develop our code uh, when we're doing this in TypeScript. There are some other, apart from the primitive types that I've mentioned, there are some other built-in types into the language. Uh, the only one worth mentioning uh, at this stage might be a regular expression type that's that that is built into the language all of you should have come across regular expressions at some stage in your programming well this is how you declare and use regular expressions in in typescript so reg reg x is a built-in type that's how you uh declare a regular expression value if you like and this is how you use it uh, you can see it being used here. You can in invoke the test method on our regular expression, pass it a string, and the test will re return true or false, depending on whether the string, uh, uh, whether the string uh, contains the particular pattern that you're looking for uh, in it. I suppose I've got a couple of console.logs here, and the obvious. Uh, thing that we don't know yet is how, how do I run a TypeScript program? And so you bring up your command line. And if you, the readme will actually tell you. So once you've done npm install, then this is how you run a TypeScript program. So let's do that. So it's npx. TS node, and then the pass to the particular file. And now, because it's index, I can leave that out. I can be, I can put it in if I want to. I don't have to though. It defaults to index.ts. So what's happening here is this TS node, uh, this TS node utility. What it does is it takes your TypeScript file, compiles it on the fly, and then runs the output of that uh, through the node uh, utility. And we know node is the utility that we use to run ordinary JavaScript. So we don't actually see the JavaScript that's generated. Uh, I'll show you how to get that in a moment, but uh, if I just hit return for now, Okay, so you know these are this this is coming from the various console.logs uh, that I have inside in this file. And you can look at them later on yourselves. That's how you uh, that's how you run a TypeScript without actually having to compile it first and then run it separately. Uh, if you do want to compile it, uh, if you do want to compile it, then the command to do that. It's also in the readme. Uh, this is the command here in pxtsc, as in TypeScript compiler. Now, we're going to get an error here now, but that's okay. Let's, let's see the error first. As I said, you will you will never need to do an explicit compilation. You'll always be using TS node, as far as I'm concerned. But let's just do it anyway. Uh, what did I do there? NPX TSC. Oh, sorry, I've left. There's an error in the code. Let's see. Let's fix the error. Let's get rid of that. Well, the compiler. I guess the compiler just worked really. It's telling you that there is a compilation error uh, on this particular line. That's fine. Uh, but now that we know it's clean, and I know it's clean because in my problems tab. 
always keep an eye on the problems tab before you start running any TypeScript code or compiling it explicitly. Uh, that has to be, this has to be, uh, in 99% of cases, this has to be empty. Uh, so it is in this case. So now let's compile it. Okay, uh, I was actually expecting an error. Let's see, did I? Oh yeah, okay, I'm actually, <laughs> I shouldn't have said there's gonna be an error. Um, right, you can see here now, there is a file called index.js. And so this is the, this is the um, JavaScript equivalent of my TypeScript. Just gonna leave that open for a second. So that's JavaScript and my TypeScript is here. And uh, clearly, well, not clearly, but like all of the type related syntax in my TypeScript, there's, there's none of that in my JavaScript. That's all quote unquote lost. It's not really like, but it's, it, there's no, there's no evidence of it at all in my, in my JavaScript because JavaScript is a dynamically typed language. It doesn't understand, it doesn't have a typing system associated with it. So that kind of uh, goes back to one of the points that I made earlier on that TypeScript is really a compile time language. It's not a runtime language. The runtime language is JavaScript. Uh, and so I, I now have a JavaScript file and if I wanna run that, well, I just run it the way I would run all JavaScript, uh, which is to use Node. And it's index.js in this case. And, oh yeah, that's uh, that's the point. That's This is the error that I was expecting earlier on, actually. I'm getting an error. Why am I getting an error? It's complaining about the export statements in my JavaScript. And it's essentially telling me that the export statements in my JavaScript are old style export statements. Technically, they would be referred to as common JS, export, export import, right? Uh, statements that I'm using common JS export import statements in my JavaScript, but in my package.json, I have declared that the types of import export statements should be the newer type of um, export import statements, which are referred to as ES6 or module statements. I'm telling you all of this now, but really, you, <laughs> You don't need to concern yourself with it, but just to get to get it working, because I'd like to be able to run my JavaScript. Um, to get it working, I've got it in my package.json, I've got to state that any JavaScript code that I want to run from within this project uh, will be using old style stroke common JS export import statements. And the way I do that is by saying uh, that it's common JS that I'm using. Now, if I save that, and now if I run it, it runs successfully. This is the same output as I got earlier on when I ran my TypeScript. And if I go back, see here, it's the same output. So my, my JavaScript, uh, not surprisingly, generates the exact same uh, output as my TypeScript. Again, don't worry about all this fitting around with package.json. You won't need to do it, but just to explain why I did get an error when I tried to run the uh, JavaScript the first time. Now I'm gonna change that back in package.json for now.
you will never uh, you will never need to look at the raw JavaScript that's generated from your TypeScript. Uh, and probably the vast, vast majority of TypeScript programmers never look at the raw JavaScript. It's only in very extreme edge cases that you might need to look at the JavaScript. You know, you let the compiler do its thing. You don't have to uh, check to make sure it's doing the right thing. Okay, that's type annotations. Uh, Typed arrays, um, how do we declare an array uh, in TypeScript? Here's the uh, syntax. So my nums is a variable and its type is numbers array. So this is the this is the way you declare that it's an array of things. And indeed I am assigning it an array of numbers. Okay, we've got some examples of that. Typed arrays in my uh, little project. Okay, so that's the example that we have. And, you know, surprise, surprise, if I try and add a Boolean to this array, then it doesn't like it. All right now, I'm trying to get rid of that. Um, you see here, the from a visual point of view, Whenever you see, well, in my case, and because of the theme that I'm using, whenever I see that heavy orange underline, uh, there's a compile time error. And if I look at the problems tab down here, it's saying uh, type Boolean is not assignable to type number because indeed I have declared this as being an array of numbers and true is not a valid uh, number value, if you like. Uh, so, but in, in JavaScript, you know, in JavaScript arrays can have a mixture of different types uh, within them, as you know. So again, JavaScript would not complain about this uh, because it does not support typed arrays, but it's not until runtime. Uh, and let's say in our runtime, in our, in our code, at some stage, we iterate over this array and we carry out some arithmetic operation on each element in the array. It's not until we hit the true entry and start doing an arithmetic operation that probably the program is going to crash. And then we have to start debugging why there's a crash and it all comes back to the fact that we included a non-numeric value in our array. Whereas with TypeScript, it's telling me straight away, you've got a problem here. Um, this is also another way of declaring an array uh, and the reason, the only reason I'm showing it here is because we will see this syntax later on. This is actually something called generics in TypeScript, but uh, clearly that's very long-winded. This is a much, uh, much shorter way of declaring uh, a, a an array of things. But uh, anyway, that's an alternative syntax. But in this case, it's an array of strings. Uh, let's see. And if we take this line here, if I uncomment it, this is another example of really the nice thing about uh, TypeScript and the way it catches essentially kind of silly things that you might try and do in your code, catches them at compile time, whereas it won't be caught until runtime in JavaScript. So here I've got uh, my array and it's an array of numbers and I want to push another entry onto the array but I'm trying to push a string onto the array and TypeScript has actually realized that's not uh, sensible because it doesn't the string doesn't match the types of the entries in the array and so you, you get a uh, you get a, a, a warning message and if, again if you read the warning message down here it's telling you that Okay, let's go back to the slides. As typed arrays, we'll come back to functions later on, but we also use this typing, uh, these type annotations with functions as well, as in we have to declare the types of the parameters in a function declaration. 
so that we safeguard against somebody trying to invoke our function with uh, parameters that don't match up the type that they're meant to be. Uh, so you can see clearly what I'm trying to say here. That, uh, the first parameter has to be of type number. Second parameter has to be of type number. In fact, we have to, sometimes we need to declare the return type as well, but I'll come back to that later on. We're not doing it here. Classes are part of TypeScript, uh, and I have examples of the syntax on the right here. I, I'm not going to talk my way through the syntax. Everybody should be familiar with the notion of classes and how we use classes in programming in general. Uh, it's just the syntax uh, is all I'm getting across here. Uh, TypeScript supports single inheritance, as in a, a class a, a, a class can only extend one other class. Is that what I'm trying to say here? Uh, yeah, single parent inheritance. There is this notion of multi parent inheritance, which other languages support TypeScript does not. And we have the notion of public and private members, as in public and private methods that uh, we can annotate. And I'm not doing it here. I think it defaults to public unless you say otherwise. So, uh, but you can declare methods as being private uh, within a class and also any instance variables that are associated with a class, they can be declared as public and private as well. Classes, as you know, were introduced to JavaScript in the ES ECMAScript 6 specification, which was in 2015. And TypeScript has simply just uh, taken that on board. Uh, interfaces uh, are also supported in TypeScript, and they have the exact same purpose and meaning as they do in other languages. And again, I'm assuming that you're familiar with interfaces from other object-oriented languages like Java. Uh, and on the right, I'm just showing you the syntax. Uh, and again, we, we use the keyword implements. So this class implements this interface. And we know what the implications of that are. That in this case, it means that in our car implementation, we have to implement uh, these two methods uh, in order to honor the interface. So I'm just going to move on from uh, this because, as I said, anybody that has done object-oriented programming in any other language will be familiar with classes and be, will be familiar with interfaces. However, TypeScript has something called interface data types. Uh, it's unfortunate that they use the word interface, but uh, so interface data types relate to uh, JavaScript objects. And we know a JavaScript object is a way of encapsulating uh, a, a collection of properties, related properties um, for a particular piece of data. Okay. So what an interface data type does is it allows us to define a, a new type uh, and for objects that will occur in our in our code. Um, and the interface data type specifies what are the properties that instances of that data type will have and what are the values that those properties are allowed. Okay, so I'm saying an interface data type tells the TypeScript compiler about the property names uh, an object can have and their corresponding uh, value types. Uh, so here's an example of an interface data type. I'm declaring a new data type. Okay, I'm reinforcing data. I'm declaring a new data type called person. I'm saying person is any an object that has two properties called first and last, and they have to be of type string. So this is a new type that I've custom type that I have defined for my application. But it's only a type. Here I'm declaring actual variable, and this variable is an instance of that type. And I'm using the post fix syntax here as before. So here's my custom type. And by by stating that me is a going to be a variable of type person, that means A, it's an object. And B, it can only have properties first and last. 
and C, those two properties have to be assigned string values. Anything else uh, the compiler is going to complain about. So if I go back to my little example scripts, So I've got my person type as I had on the slides there. Uh, here we go. And now if I do anything like if I want to add in address here, uh, straight away, the compiler is complaining. And if I open up my problems tab, uh, it's telling me, well, if I let's say I complete it, Address colon. And even if I do assign a string to it, so it, it's saying that the type this, um, sorry, the type first string last string address address string is not assignable to. Well, okay, I've lost it, but if you mouse over it. It's saying it's not assignable to the type person, which is just comprises of first and last. Okay, so it is more constraining in that sense. It's more constraining than than uh, than JavaScript. So I cannot just randomly add properties onto my object in that way. Say in the same way, if I assign an incorrect value to a legitimate property, it's going to complain as well. And again, if you read the error, it's telling you that, you know, essentially first should be assigned a string. You can't assign it a number. So an interface data type is a template for an object, if you like. And oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, there's a there's really nice what's called hinting. The compiler is always trying to hint to you, the developer, as to maybe what you should be typing on the keyboard. So what I mean by that is, if I just undo that for now. Um, if I uncomment this line here. So if I go me dot, telling me straight away, the only two possible things that you could be referring to uh, in the me variable is either the first property or the last property. Won't allow you to, it's kind of forcing you to pick one of these. Whereas again, in JavaScript, you could like if in JavaScript, if I typed first name, you know, if I forgot the actual structure, then it's not until at runtime that this expression here is going to that's going to result in undefined in this case, which may be problematic later on in my runtime code. Whereas in TypeScript, you know, I never get to that stage. I'm I'm told straight away, look, you're trying to refer to a property, essentially that doesn't exist on this me variable. And if you read the error again, uh, that's what it's it's stating. So that kind of hinting that the compiler does uh, behind the scenes as you're as you're developing your code is really, really uh, beneficial. Equally, you know, if you try and do that, this statement here, it's going to catch it at compile time as well. And these interface data types, you know, they open up a lot of nice possibilities for us. So just to give you an example here, I've got a, a student um, interface data type and the student has a name and ID and a modules property where modules is an array of strings. I've got a, here's an instance of a student object. Okay, so student X and that all makes sense. These. Uh, values make sense. And again, if I try and do something to, let's say, if I put in a numeric value here, 
you know, it's going to complain because it, it, it'll work its way back to the interface data type and it'll say, well, this has been declared as an array of strings. You can not put a non-string value into that array and again, catches it at compile time. Uh, I've got a results interface data type. That's fine. I've got a, a student profile data type, and it has you know, a couple of properties. It has a name property, and the name property is of type. It's no longer a primitive type. Now I'm using, I'm actually using a custom type. Uh, it's of type person, and person we defined earlier on in this script. Uh, and results here is an array of custom types as well, because the result I've defined up here as being, uh, where's your other result there? So I'm saying this property is an array of those things. And here's an instance of a student profile. So I've got this variable called that. Its type is that. And, you know, the compiler will check that all of these things are consistent with the various interface data types that you are using in the declaration of the student profile type. Okay, so as our, as our data types are growing larger and larger, that's where the benefit of TypeScript really comes in because it's still monitoring behind the scenes that you are not doing anything silly um, in terms of the values that you're assigning to uh, properties within an object in this case. And again, you know, I'm probably tired of it now at this stage, but if I, if I do something like, you know, put a string here, it'll work its way back to, it realizes that, uh, what type is this? Uh, th these objects should be of type result. And we said that result, its structure was that there. Okay, so it should be an array, uh, it should be a number. Second property, the grade property should be a number. But here I've tried to assign a string to it. And it has worked out that that, uh, that doesn't match up and again, if you read the error, it, it's telling you that. Okay, that's uh, interface data types. What's next? Uh, next is type aliases. Uh, there's a number of parts to type aliases and one part of type aliases is really another way of declaring uh, structures of objects. In other words, it kind of overlaps with interface data types. And when people look at type aliases initially, they kind of think to themselves, well, aren't type aliases really the same as interface data types? And, and yes, they are. But if you read a little bit more on type aliases, there are things that you can do with them that you cannot do with interface data types. So that's what I'm saying in, in this kind of sentence here. They do overlap. So here's an example of the use of type aliases. Uh, and if we look at the third example first, I, I probably should have uh, sequenced these things differently. But if you look at this example down here, uh, this is an example of one example of a type alias. Uh, I'm using the keyword type. I'm declaring, I'm essentially declaring an, a custom data type for myself. And I'm saying the, the point type is an object with two properties. The properties keys are X and Y, and the values are number in both cases. Now, that's really the exact same uh, as an interface data type. There's only a slight difference in the syntax, which you just might might catch you out initially. See the way I'm using an equal sign here between the the name of the type and the the structure of the type, whereas in interface data types. There is no equals. Um, there's no equals operator used. So that's only just a slight syntax difference. But I could have used interface data types really instead of type aliases to declare my point type. 
So that's where they overlap. But the other places, the other examples of usage of this type aliases is, well, here's a, uh, one case for what's called a union type. I'm declaring a type here, custom type called alphanumeric. I should probably have capitalized it. Uh, the convention is to capitalize all your custom data types. But I'm saying the alphanumeric type is either a string type or a number type. And so that means if I declare a variable and its type is alphanumeric in my case, then I could assign that variable uh, a numeric value or I can assign it a string value and the compiler won't complain because I have said, told us the alphanumeric in my case um, type could be a string type or a numeric type. You can kind of read this as the R operator. Uh, and there are cases when that is useful to us. There are cases when um, a variable could have one or two different types of values assigned to it. It, it makes sense in, in, in many cases. Uh, again, from a from kind of language point of view, line 11 is a declaration. Of, I, I, uh, I'm declaring a type, whereas line 12, I'm declaring a variable. Uh, so a variable is something that can have a value. A type doesn't have a value. You're just saying something about its structure, if you like. Uh, line 15, I'm declaring a type using the type alias syntax. In line 16, I'm declaring a variable. And variables can be assigned values. And so I'm assigning it a value. Uh, line 18, I'm and right down here, is declaring a, a type as well. Whereas down here, I'm declaring a variable. Uh, the other, another example of type aliases, and we'll come back to union types. This is called the union type. I'll come back to it in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, but here's another use case for type aliases, and this is called literal types. And it's a little bit off-putting initially. So I'm declaring a type called pet category, and I'm saying any variable that is going to be of this type the only values it can have are either the string cat or the string dog or the string goldfish. So it's a bit like an enumerated value from other languages. And so here's an example of me declaring a variable. Uh, I'm assigning it that type. And indeed, I am assigning it one of its legitimate values. This is called a literal type. Again, that can be quite useful. And I'll say a little bit more on literal types later on. So that's type aliases. Uh, if I go back to our little examples. Okay, so I've got a course. I'm using type alias to define a course here. Could have used the interface data type for that. Here I've got uh, another type alias, and I'm declaring a type called academic entity, and I'm saying acad academic entity is either a student type or a course type. Student is something that I defined earlier on, if you remember. Uh, back up to here, I defined student. And so I'm doing a little bit of nesting now, I suppose, if you like, or uh, referencing one type referring to another type. So academic entity anyway, any object of type, any variable of type at academic entity could be assigned a student object or a course object, course being this thing here. Here's an example of a variable and it's of type academic entity. And in this case, it looks like uh, well, I'm assigning it an actual variable called student X, and I declared student X earlier on, and student X, surprise, surprise, is an object of type student. So that assignment statement there down here is, is legitimate uh, because, uh, act, because student X is an object of type student, then it is implicitly an object of type 
academic entity. And the compiler doesn't complain. By the way, the, the underlining that you're seeing here, uh, that's just a VS Code thing telling me that this variable is not being used. You've declared a variable and you're not using it. That's not a, clearly that's not a compiler error. Uh, it, it's probably telling you maybe you should clean up your code a little bit because you're you're not using some variables that you declared. Uh, it's not a compiler error. Uh, moving on. Uh, okay, I've got a function here that takes a property, takes a parameter of type academic entity. Now, when you've got that kind of scenario, um, I guess somewhere within the implementation of that function, you may you may need to narrow down as to what exactly is this parameter. Is it a student or is it a course? And I'm doing that using a traditional if statement. And all the if statement is doing is this if statement is checking to see does the parameter that was passed in to me, does it have a property called code? And if you look back, uh, my course type one of its properties is code uh whereas student does have does not have code so that's that's this is one way of narrowing down what particular uh type of academic entity do i have um i'll come back to that again this idea again a little bit later on wouldn't worry too much about it uh okay Back to my slides. Uh, there are type aliases, although we've only really, we only can only make sense of uh, a type alias where we're, uh, where, uh, as we're using it here, let's say. Okay, this line here, as I've explained, it makes sense. And this line here, makes sense as, I, as I've explained it, but I'll, I'll come back to a little bit those two uh, usages of type aliases a little bit more uh, later on. Type inferencing. Uh, if type inferencing really wasn't part of TypeScript language, it's debatable as, if, as to whether the language would have become as popular as it is. And the, the point of type inferencing is that the TS uh, TypeScript compiler can infer the type of a variable based on the values uh, that are being assigned to that variable. So if you look at this example here, I am declared, I'm declaring a variable called a string. Note here, I'm not specifying its type. Uh, I'm assigning it a string. Now, uh, I guess if I go back to here and explain really it might be better within the IDE. So here we go. And so the question is, what type is that variable? And you can ask VS Code to tell you what type does the compiler think it is by uh, hitting the command sequence. And I'm doing this on my keyboard now. I'm I'm hitting the command sequence uh, command K, command I. And that's my way of asking VS Code, what type is this thing? And you can see it's telling me uh, that it's the compiler is inferring the string type onto this variable. Similarly here. Well, sorry, let's, let's, let's not do that. So so that's, that's, that's the 101 of type inferencing, that the compiler can infer the type of a variable. If you haven't explicitly declared it, it will infer it from uh, the assignment that you make to that variable. Uh, and so as you become more experienced as a TypeScript developer, and I don't expect you to be an experienced TypeScript developer at the end of this module, but as you become more experienced, what you will find yourself doing is uh, typing assigning explicit types to a variable far less, which means that you you don't actually have to type as much syntax as you would have to if type inferencing wasn't available within the language. In other words, you become much more productive as a developer because you have to physically type less syntax as a result of type inferencing. 
So a lot of the stuff that I've done up here, I didn't have to use uh, the type annotation here at all. And pretty well most of the statements that I have so far, where I have been explicit about the type, uh, where I have used type annotations, I didn't have to use them. And it's not that uh, it's not that you're a bad programmer if you don't use type annotations. In fact, you're a more experienced TypeScript programmer the less type annotations that you write. Provided, of course, that the compiler does infer the correct type on a variable when you don't uh, specify using annotations. So type inferencing is where the compiler infers the type based on the value that you assign to it. And we try and leverage that as much as we possibly can uh, because that makes life a little bit easier on the uh, on the developer. And if I just go back, let's say to, if I go back to, uh, let's see, here. Okay, and if I mouse over my variable and I hit the keyboard sequence, command K, command I, you can see, look, it's got it right. It's inferred the correct type for me. Now, I don't think, let's see, would it work it out down here? Supposing I got rid of it here. Command K, Command I. No, it hasn't worked it out there and I wouldn't have expected it really. Um, uh, it's, it's only telling you, look, that this this is the shape of the the object, but it's not telling you that it's it's a, an object of type student. So uh, it, it won't work it out there for me. So I should undo that really. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah. Uh, if you see, if you take this statement here, uh, so the caras method, uh, as you know, uh, it it picks out a particular character within the source string, and it assigns it to this variable. Uh, but I'm not declaring what type this is. But the compiler will actually work it out for me. Uh, I know it should be a string, but if I do command K, command I, it works it out that it is a string. Also, if we look at the other example of the other example, uh, where was it? Oh yeah, this one here. If I access the linked property, no, you, uh, this is an array, if you remember from earlier on, this is an array of numbers, uh, but it's an array and the linked property returns the length of that array. Sorry, th this is an array of strings, I beg your pardon. This is an array of strings. The linked property returns the number of entries in that array. So len here should be a numeric type. And again, if I do command K, command I, it has inferred that it is. Command K, Command I. Uh, it has inferred the the correct type uh, as being number. I didn't have to, so it would be unnecessary for me to to add the annotation onto the len property there. Uh, what else? I'm not sure why am I saying this line is an error. Okay, I'm just going to ignore that for now. Didn't seem like a sensible example. Uh, this is an array of, uh, let's see now, sorry. If we take this example, are we in time? No, we don't have enough time. Right. Uh, 
I should stop really at this stage. I hope you're still with me. So we pick it up from here the next day. Now, what I need to do is uh, upload this archive onto Slack so that you can play with it. We haven't gotten very far on it, really. In terms of the lab, I suppose I'll talk to you about the lab maybe on Thursday. Thursday. I we'll just quickly look at the TypeScript lab. Uh, if you were to start it, you would be able to, let's see, uh, startup, that's okay. Interface data types, you could do that section of the lab because we've covered interface data types, uh, functions we haven't covered. So you see, so really the only part of it that you'll be able to uh, tackle is the very first part, but that's, that's worthwhile anyway, uh, if you want to start the lab. Hopefully we'll get through script code the next day. I, I was pending assigning two weeks, but I'm not sure if I'm going to get through it in two weeks now. But anyway, that's my problem. Okay, I'll leave it at that for now. If there are any closing questions, feel free to ask me. No, all right. I'll uh, thanks for hanging on. If you're still there, and I'll talk to you on Thursday. Bye bye. Thank you, Gil. Thank you.